Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Really excited for today's event. We're going to catch up uh, with Paul Salopek on his Out of Eden walk. But before we introduce Paul, we're going to take just a, a brief moment to share my screen and take a look at uh, National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for where uh, everybody's joining us from today. So just bear with me for a moment. The screen should share. There we go. And you should see my screen now. So this X here is representing me in Alora, uh, Ontario, so in Canada. And as we start to back up, we're going to get to see some of our classrooms. So about 20 minutes away from me, we have a classroom in Guelph, Ontario. As we continue to back out a little bit more, we've got a classroom joining us in Illinois. If we move to Western Canada, we've got classrooms joining us in British Columbia, uh, as well as Cal um, Alberta. And then we also have a classroom joining us uh, from Alabama today. And if we go across the Pacific Ocean, we can get a little sense of where Paul's joining us from today. Oops, it didn't stick on the map, but Paul's right here uh, in Calcutta. So I'm gonna end the screen share now. As I'm doing that, I just wanna remind all the classrooms who are tuning in live on YouTube that you can still get in on the action on the right. You should be able to find a YouTube chat sidebar and you can send us in a question, let us know where you're watching from. And to any classrooms who are joining us today, I see our viewers climbing quickly. Um, Use Twitter, take some pictures of your class in action, hashtag them explore our classroom. Um, definitely tag Paul in them as well, as well as at, uh, at Nat Geo uh, Education, because we love to see uh, the classrooms in action. So we have Paul joining us. Paul's on a 21,000 mile out of Eden walk. He's tracing the pathways of the first humans who migrated out of Africa in the Stone Age, eventually making their way to the southernmost tip of South America, uh, Terra del Fuego. Along the way, he's practicing slow journalism, meeting people and recording their stories while covering the major uh, issues of our time from climate change uh, to techno technological innovation, from mass migration to cultural survival. His words, as well as his photographs, videos, and audio are creating a global record of human life at the start of the new millennium, told by everybody. Villagers, nomads, traders, farmers, soldiers, and artists rarely uh, do make the news. So Paul, it is so great to have you join us. Um, the trail. Great, Joe. It's great to be with everybody, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay and, and see me okay. Uh, greetings from South Asia. Greeting from the great city of Calcutta in India. Uh, it's one of these mega cities that uh, has pulses of daily migration. Uh, about uh, there are ten million people here all the time, and about ten million people migrate or um, commute into the city every 24 hours they come in and they go out so you've got the city population basically doubling from 10 to 20 million people every single day um, as people move out to the outskirts after working so uh, greetings everybody I'm glad to see that uh, north america is well represented all right well paul yeah uh, you've been making your way through india it sounds like since we connected last you've made quite a bit uh of time yeah, I've been pushing hard with my walking partner, Sid Agarwal. We've been walking through mainly north central India. Um, we're about um, three or four days walk out of the uh, sacred pilgrimage city of Benares or Varanasi on the Ganges River. You guys have probably heard of the Ganges. Um, I hope to be uh, I'm on a side trip right now teaching journalism here in Calcutta. I hope to be back on the trail in a few days and then angling northeast towards the uh, Minyamar border, towards uh, what used to be called Burma. All right, so what we're gonna do now, Paul, is you have um, shared some photos with me. So we're gonna uh, share the screen and classrooms, if you remember, uh, just click at the bottom now, click on my screen. So it's gonna highlight it in uh, white and then we'll uh, be locked in on the picture. So here we go, jumping in. All right, Paul, let me know if you see them and then go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, I sure do. Thanks, Joe. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of give you a brief uh, little bit of background on each one of these images. I just wanted to share some of the landscapes and people that I'm seeing as I walk across this amazing, vast, diverse country. I mean, India is huge. Um, without question, it'll be the country that has uh, like the biggest span of territory that I've covered so far close to about 2,500 miles, 4,000 kilometers by the time I walk across its north. Um, of course, it's the biggest democracy in the world. 
uh, about 1.2 uh, to 1.3 billion people live in India. And India is extraordinarily um, packed with, with uh, a wide variety of people uh, in its various states and, and uh, territories. And what I did is I crossed into India from the country of Pakistan back in the spring, um, back in uh, late February, March. And that's where this picture is. Uh, this is a photo of a region of, of northern, uh, northwestern India called Punjab. Very wet, um, humid, uh, very green, as you can see, kind of the uh, grain basket of India. Very rich, very fertile country uh, that uh, fed the, uh, the, the soils made very fertile by the Indus River, one of these famous historic rivers. And that's, uh, that's a sunset on the uh, agricultural plains of the Punjab. Very pretty. Next image. So, you know, people ask me, who do I talk to as I'm walking across the world? And I've been walking, as, as some of you know, for almost six years now. I left Ethiopia, uh, the country in uh, northeastern Africa, back in January of 2013. Uh, this winter will be coming up on year six. I mean, all kinds of people, as Joe said, um, and uh, all kinds of kids. And uh, these youngsters are from the same family. They're uh, a brother and sister and a cousin from a, a Sikh family up near Amritsar, uh, which is one of the uh, sacred cities of the Sikhs. Um, kids are great. Uh, when I meet them on the walking trail, they're always very curious and often the first people to greet me in villages and towns as I'm walking down the country roads or, or highways, uh, making my way across the world in the footsteps of the first human beings who migrated across the world back uh, in the Pleistocene, back in the Stone Age. Next image. You know, um, the Out of Eden Walk project is a storytelling project above anything else. Uh, yes, it's about walking. I'm, I'm walking the earth. I'm going about three miles an hour or five kilometers an hour across several continents, um, telling stories as I go. And one of the great stories uh, that I've been uh, encountering again and again, kind of a big story in India, um, is environmental issues. Uh, India is a country that, uh, through the help of technology, through the help of what's called the green revolution, the use of industrial machinery to farm, the use of fertilizers, pesticides, um, crops, uh, crop varieties that are high yield, has really turned its food uh, situation around. It used to be uh, a bit vulnerable to hunger three generations back, and now it not only feeds itself, but it actually exports food. That said, um, that's come at some cost. Um, two factors are affecting uh, the stability of agricultural production in this gigantic country. One is climate change. Um, the monsoon seasons, that's what the rainy seasons are called, in some places are getting more erratic, more unpredictable, making it harder for farmers to predict when to uh, sow and harvest their crops. And another is a large amount of groundwater pumping. I mean, if you're feeding so many people and you're, and you're growing so much food, um, you've got to get the water from somewhere. And if it's not coming from the sky in the form of rain, the only other place is from rivers or groundwater, underwater uh, sources called aquifers. And uh, I'm writing about this. I've written about it uh, quite a bit already. I'll continue to write about it. It's a big issue here, uh, water conservation and water security. Of the 1.2 or so billion human beings who live in India, um, a big study done uh, recently shows that up to half of the people here live in some form of a water crisis, whether it's a water quantity crisis, they don't have enough water, uh, drinking water uh, and uh, crop water to, to get by, or the quality of the water has been impacted by pollution or, or other factors. So this is a picture that you're looking at here of an ancient um, uh, step well. It's an ancient well that was built probably four or five centuries ago in the middle of the Tar Desert uh, of Rajasthan. And what's really cool about this picture is that this ancient technology in a very dry environment, guys, if you can imagine a, a semi-desert with lots of sand, uh, a tree here and there, um, very hot, you know, 50 degrees centigrade, 115, 118 degrees of Fahrenheit in the summer. In the middle of these um, deserts, people from the past knew the environment so well that they built these artifacts to collect rain. This is basically 
a well that harvests the rivers in the sky, if you will, the rivers that come with seasonal rains. And it's also, as you can see, very beautiful. Next image. Um, this photograph depicts some of the lovely, lovely countryside of north central India. This is a region called the Chambal, a rocky red sandstone. Uh, this gentleman is a uh, priest who is the guardian of a Hindu temple. And uh, my walking partner, um, Priyanka Borbujari, and I had spent the night at this temple. And this gentleman uh, very kindly took us up to a height above the temple to kind of show us the lay of the land. Uh, a very lovely, lovely spot in India that very few people um, like myself ever get to see because it's quite far off the beaten track. And guys, that's another. Um, benefit and advantage, a gift of the walk, if you will, is that by walking, I get off the main thoroughfares, get off the highways, and get to explore parts of countries that uh, very few outsiders see. The next image, Joe. In much of the rural world and in societies that are still agrarian, and you guys know what the word agrarian means, this is societies that depend on agriculture, that live close to the land, that depend on natural resources in a very direct mode, whether it's river water, rainwater, uh, food coming from uh, the soil, um, people work. And that means everybody use, uh, gets involved in physical labor. And this is a young boy, he's 12 years old, uh, shepherding goats along uh, a river, uh, the Chamba River in, in central India. Um, he was out all day. He will be taking care of goats for maybe eight to nine hours out by himself. And as young as he is, he's very responsible. He seemed like a little man to me, you know, like a little adult. Uh, he took his job very seriously um, and knew quite a bit about the river biology, just from pure observation. Uh, an amazing a young, young person to me, you know, many on, on the trail. Next image. And these are our nomads that I met just a couple of weeks ago. These chaps are pushing sheep across northern India. As you can see, they're loading up a cargo animal. Um, and they move big distances, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. Uh, and I think they were moving with about 300 sheep. They told me they would be on the trail on foot for about three months. Next image. And this is just a pretty picture, right? Um, India. You know, you might see pictures uh, where you come from on TV or on the internet of India being a, uh, a country of big cities uh, teeming with people, and that is true. But it also has these amazing, beautiful, peaceful uh, uh, panoramas in its back country. This is a river called the River Ken uh, Sunset, uh, part of a national park where there are actually tigers uh, living. So if you can imagine, uh, the wildlife back in those trees, back in the distance, uh, including tigers, um, that's probably not a place you might uh, want to camp, right? Next image. Uh, and just wrapping up here, I think maybe there's one more after this. This just shows the kind of hospitality that I'm usually greeted with as I walk across the world. I've met literally thousands of people as I, as I move on foot from country to country. And almost everybody is curious and friendly. And these are schoolboys. Um, they've just taken a test, an exam. You can almost see the relief on their faces after the examination period. Uh, and they've just posing with me to take a picture. Uh, the gentleman in the foreground who's taking the picture, the guy with the beard, he's my walking partner, Siddharth Agarwal. He's an expert on river ecology in India. A very interesting guy to walk with. I've learned a lot about rivers from Sid. And speaking of rivers, this last image is a picture of Sid walking just, uh, gosh, days ago with me along the mighty and very famous and historic Ganges River. That's the river you see uh, in the background. Um, Sid and I had uh, been walking, gosh, more than a month together. Uh, and this was just a day or two after we finally hit this amazing highway of water that has been a conduit of history and civilization for thousands and thousands of years in, in South Asia. It was quite a sight and it was quite moving to finally reach this river after walking, gosh, almost 2,000 kilometers or more than 1,200 miles across India to reach it. And that's it for the images.
All right, so I'm gonna stop the screen share now and we're gonna switch over to Q&A mode. But before we do, Paul, I just wanna um, give a shout out to our live viewers. We have tons of groups joining us today. I wanna give a shout out to Lando Lakes, Florida, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Miami, uh, Bronx, New York. We've got a classroom in Hawaii, Ohio, Michigan, wow. um, New Mexico, Vermont. We have groups from all over joining us. And we're gonna get started with this first question from second graders in Canton, Michigan, Mr. Chris's class, how many shoes have you worn through so far? Yeah, well, you know, I've actually lost track. Um, I think it's between six and seven. Um, the shoes are amazing. I mean, the modern day technology, this, this material called Vibram, you guys have heard of Vibram soles, um, is really tough. And so, uh, you do the math, and I think that averages out to somewhere like, like 1,500 miles per pair of shoes, which ain't bad, right? Because these shoes last a while. They're, they're modern hiking shoes, modern walking shoes. All right. Well, let's meet a live classroom. So let's take a trip to let's start in British Columbia. Courtney, British Columbia, I have some grade sixes and sevens, Mr. Sweeney and Mrs. Black's groups. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, boys and girls? Good. All right. Hey, we've got the question. Anybody have a question? Nobody has a question. Nice and loud for us. Um, how long do you walk for every day? Okay. Good question. You know, it varies. Uh, the, the walk is subject to all the kinds of obstacles that you would find if you were like hiking with your family on a weekend, going to a national park, for example. And that could be high mountains, it could be river crossings, it could be, you know, navigating your way among dense forest. And that kind of thing slows you down. But what really slows me down our stories, right? My project is about talking to people and listening to people. So for example, if I'm walking through the countryside and I meet um, a fisherman at a water hole and he, I sit down next to him and say, hey, how's your luck? Have you caught anything? And if he starts telling me an interesting story, I might be there for a while. Instead of a 15 minute rest break, I might end up being there for a couple hours. So these kind of surprise encounters, these kind of chance meetings with human beings along the trail for across cultures, across languages, across countries, religions, faiths, creeds, you name it. That is what actually defines my foot speed. So I could go anywhere from like a couple miles or a couple kilometers in a day if I'm running into lots of interesting stories with people or sometimes I just stop for the day. If this man uh, takes me home to his family and shows me his farm or, or what have you, I might end up spending the night with him. All the way up to, say, there aren't any people around. Let's say I'm crossing the icy mountains of Central Asia, and I have to get over them quickly before nightfall because it'll be way too cold to be caught up, exposed on top of a glacier. In that case, I'll walk as fast as I can, and probably the longest I've ever walked is somewhere like 55 kilometers or what is that, like 32 miles in a day. That's a really long day. Um, but that would be an extraordinary day. Good question. All right, thanks for the question. Let's jump over to Guelph, Ontario now. We have Mrs. Green's class, grades seven and eight. So let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Guelph? Hi, we're good. All right, who's up? Doing good. All right, go ahead, Sam. What's the strangest thing you've seen while walking? Yeah. The strangest thing I've seen while walking. Hmm. You know, that's a stumper. Um, the whole world is strange. You know, if you think about it, if you step back from your life, if you're able to separate yourself from what seems like the ordinary of your daily life and look at it objectively, life can be pretty strange. Um, Random encounters with people who do extraordinary things is very strange. Um, nature can be seem miraculous and full of wonders. So the, if I had to be honest with you, I'd have to say that every single day is pretty strange and almost always in a good way. Every new day on the trail presents me with surprises that 
are never the same as yesterday or the day before. Uh, and that's one of the great gifts of this journey as well. It's kind of a learning journey for me um, where I'm forced to confront new things, new ideas among people or new phenomenon in nature um, and accommodate myself to them. And it's a, it's, it's a good thing that the world's a strange place because otherwise we'd be pretty dull, wouldn't it? No question. Great, great question and a solid answer, Paul. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's go to Alabama this time. Mrs. Cargo's group, grade eights, are joining us from Hoover. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Alabama? Good. Guys. Um, okay, so which was the most interesting country you've been to so far? Wow. Yeah, another good question. And it's a tough one to answer. And I'm not just being diplomatic. I'm not trying to like not offend one country by praising another. Um, I found um, the Middle East to be pretty interesting. Uh, I had spent a lot of time in the Middle East early on. I was a, a foreign correspondent for a newspaper called the Chicago Tribune. And I, I covered a lot of conflicts, right? I was in Iraq. Um, and I was able to walk through the Middle East for the first time, not in a, in a fast reporting mode. My project is about slow reporting, slow journalism, which in essence means slow storytelling. And in the past, when I was covering that part of the world, I would fly to a country, I would rent a car at the airport. I would hire a local colleague, another journalist, you know, an Arab journalist from Jordan or from whatever country and, and work with that person and then leave fairly quickly because the news, you know, never sleeps, you know, the churn of the news, as you guys have heard, it's 24 seven, it's all the time. I got off of that merry-go-round when I started this project six years ago, I got off that high speed cycle of, of information and, and decided not to take cars, not to take planes um, and just walk through the stories of the day. And one of the most remarkable countries that I think I walked through was Saudi Arabia, a country that when you think about it, at least in outside of Saudi Arabia, doesn't seem to be terribly interesting. It's usually depicted as like sand dunes, kind of flat desert, um, a few camels here and there, some big cities with glass towers, you know, an oil economy. It's one of the world's biggest oil producers and not much else. But the, the surprise for me was that when I walked up the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia and I spent almost seven months walking up that desert there are very small regional differences there are ethnic groups people descended from desert nomads called bedouin and they speak different dialects and they dress differently and they have different folklore and they have different music and they have different cultures and that i guess was probably the, one of the more surprising and interesting countries is that what i thought would be kind of a flat to be frank kind of a can a, a dull human landscape turned out to be surprisingly diverse and colorful. And that was, that was a great discovery. Walking through the Caucasus was another interesting uh, place. The Caucasus guys is that mountainous region between Europe and Asia with countries like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, where they have very tough people, you know, mountain people are often pretty tough. And Georgia was, was amazing to me because they're people who really cherish their history and are very proud, proud people. And they do two things that I find pretty admirable. One, they invented wine, right? 8,000 years ago, these folks were the first ones to ferment wine and they still have a really rich wine uh, making culture. Almost every family uh, ferments its own wine in its villages. And then the second thing is, is they have a, a, an amazing and wonderful admiration for poetry. You know, you can tell a country and its civilization by who they put on a pedestal in their cities, right? Who their heroes are. Some countries put generals on top of horses. Some countries put politicians in business suits. Um, some countries put warriors, et cetera, et cetera. Georgia puts its poets on a pedestal. And almost all Georgians know something about the country's poetry. And even when you get married in Georgia, you're expected to have memorized and recite some poetry. And any country that celebrates its poets uh, has my vote of confidence. So that was another favorite place. All right, awesome. So we're gonna jump to Alberta this time. We're gonna go to Spruce Grove. We have a group of grade threes joining us with Mrs. Holden. Let me turn their microphone on. 
How we doing, Spruce Grove? Hello. What do you remember most about the Ganges River? Oh, that is a good question. You know, a couple things. And I've just, I've got to remind you, I've just encountered the Ganges for, for a few days. So the Ganges and I are just making friends right now. We're just getting to know each other. But one is the silence that this big old river holds. Almost like it's not just a channel carrying water, but it's almost like a big groove in the earth that's carrying silence with it, which is again unexpected to me. It's a surprise because there are just so many people in India. India is a pretty noisy country, right? There are a lot of cars, there's tractors, there's honking, there's people talking. But the part of, of the Ganges that I've walked through was almost crystalline in its silence. And this river seems to, seemed to hold the silence within its banks, a very lovely, a lovely quality. And the second thing was the, the color of this river. This river changed colors almost every time you turned your head to look at it. And I don't know why. It's like the light was bouncing off of it a little differently and it would go from tea and milk tan to gunmetal gray to sky blue. It was just this river that seemed to change colors all the time. So those are the two things that I've discovered. I hope to learn more about the Ganges. I'll be walking along it for quite a while. Great question from Alberta. Thanks so much, boys and girls. We're gonna go to British Columbia again. We're gonna go to Nakas, British Columbia. We've got some grade nines joining us with Mrs. Uh, Flesseker. Let me turn their microphone on. Where is it? There it is. How are we doing grade nines? Uh, good. How many languages do you speak? Okay, so um, I'm speaking to you in my, my native language, English, but I grew up in Mexico, uh, in central Mexico, in, in the state of Jalisco, so I speak fluent Spanish. Um, I worked in Africa for the Chicago Tribune for almost 10 years, so I picked up some French because large parts of Africa were colonized by France, and French is the lingua franca. And then uh, in the course of covering wars in, in the Middle East, I picked up a smattering of Arabic. And then lately on this project, I've had to learn a bit of Russian. And I've had two great Russian teachers, one in Georgia and one in Kazakhstan, who've helped me master that language, which is of course a language of great literature. I must say I speak both Russian and Arabic and French pretty poorly, um, but uh, you know, you do what you can, just enough to be understood. All right, and a quick trip to our final last classroom. They're joining us from Riverside, Illinois. Uh, some more high school students uh, with Mrs. Martin. Let me turn her microphone on. How are we doing, Illinois? Hey, guys. <laughs> um, my question, our, our question is, how do you communicate with a lot of like the native people if they don't speak like um, fluent English or like languages that you've known? Like, how do you share their story? That's a really excellent question. You're thinking like a storyteller. You're thinking like a journalist. Good for you. You know, what I have to fall back on, if I can't speak the language, is a translator, right? An interpreter. And who, how do I get an interpreter? How do I find somebody who can translate? I walk with them. So what I often tell students who are following uh, the Out of Eden walk is that I'm not walking alone hardly ever. I walk through one country alone, the country of Cyprus, a small island. But all the other time, I've been accompanied by local people. And one reason is that local people know both the directions and the landscape and the traditions and the cuisine and the culture. But they also become characters in my story. They become more than just mere guides. They're co-walkers. Co they actually help me decide where to go and what stories to tell. Um, but alongside that, they also help me uh, interpret conversations that I might have with anybody along the way. So one of the requirements that I ask for the people who do walk with me is that when we do stop at a village or a city or, or wherever, um, if I need to do an interview with someone, they help interpret that conversation. All right, well, we're gonna grab a few questions from online now, because there's there's so many, but we're gonna pick a, we're gonna pick a few. So I'm gonna start with, um, we have our class in New Mexico is wondering about keeping healthy. Are you 
Are you losing weight? And do you ever listen to music while you walk? <laughs> Good questions. They might be related. Um, um, you know, as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty skinny to begin with. So, uh, you know, I pretty much maintain uh, a, a pretty constant weight. Walking keeps you pretty lean. Uh, it also keeps you pretty healthy. I was just talking to an Indian friend just earlier this evening, and she had asked the same question about health and had I gotten sick. Yeah, I do get sick like everybody. You know, I, I, I got um, pneumonia in, in Palestine. I had to kind of stop the walk and go into a clinic. Uh, and then I got pretty sick in Lahore, a, a beautiful old city in Pakistan, where I had to stop the walk for about nine days as well when I got sick. But those are two occasions that stand out in memory in almost six years of walking. And I have to ask myself, you know, how is it that I've been able to keep so healthy so long? And I think there are a couple of factors. One is that walking is by itself a healthy exercise, not just for your heart and your metabolism and all that, you know, keeping the weight off, but it also, you know, your immune system, you know, keeps you healthy doing exercise. And the second is, is that by slowing down enough to kind of ease into different environments, my body isn't shocked the way it is if I were to fly into a new city or a new country where there are a whole bunch of new microbes and then I might get sick, I'd get a cold or I'd get some sort of, you know, whatever, some sort of infectious disease. Walking is this uh, interesting antidote because it allows your body to adapt slowly to a new microbial environment. And I just am sick uh, less than the average traveler who jets around the world um, in an aircraft. And I think I'm also lucky. <laughs> and music um, yeah music i i listen to music when i write uh sometimes and i use is it, use it as a device the rhythm of music to kind of get into rhythms of writing and i realize that after about 15 or 20 minutes i don't even hear the music anymore because i'm so focused in, in the work but i don't listen to music when i'm walking um i don't think it's it goes against the purpose of the walk which is to actually um be aware be awake be alert um, and to listen. And I, I won't be able to listen if people are calling out to me, hailing me, if I've got earbuds on and I'm listening, listening to some tunes. Yeah. All right, Paul, and we'll wrap up with one more question from uh, our online community. We have, this one's come up a few times, but it just came from a seventh grade class in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And they're wondering about, are, do you ever encounter people who don't want their sh story shared? And has there ever been times where you've maybe felt a little nervous about your safety? Yeah. You know, that first question is a good one. Not anybody's asked me that before. And yes, yeah, there, there are folks uh, who, who don't want their story told for a wide variety of reasons. And not just because they might be doing bad things, right? If you run into a smuggler or, you know, a people smuggler or somebody who's doing breaking the law, um, they don't want to advertise that fact. That's normal. You expect that. But there are also people who are vulnerable. Like, think about this. Think of refugees who might be fleeing a conflict zone, who might be um, running for their lives, literally. Um, they may not want their situation to be known and their location to be known because they're very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to security forces, to bad guys who might be chasing them. Uh, so as a storyteller, you have to really balance um, the the importance of the story that you're telling uh, for a global audience and what it might do to help educate a global audience or illuminate the human condition against the well-being of the person who you meet. And I take, um, I take as a kind of a, a general philosophy the same practice that doctors do, the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm, right? Try not to do anybody harm through the act of storytelling um, and um, I don't tell everybody's stories. If they tell me, look, your story is going to make, bring me woe, it's going to make my life miserable, I would really think hard before uh, writing that story. Or I would write it in a way that protects their identity. Um, and I forget, Joe, what was the second part of that double barrel question? Uh, I think that, I think, I think you nailed, you got it in there too. It was just, does anybody just flat out turn down an interview and then do you worry about your safety? So I think, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. safety part um, I've spoken about before. Of course, I worry about my safety. I know everybody does. It's normal. It's human. Fear is good. Fear keeps you alive. And I've learned that in, in through years of conflict reporting. People who aren't afraid um, generally don't 
tend to last that long. But that said, the world is not as scary a place as the news would have you believe. I've said this often, and indeed part of the mission of my walk has turned into um, a window on the world uh, that shows that in fact, if you go out into the world and you embrace uh, people honestly, openly, um, eye to eye, uh, most of them will be very friendly and you don't have much to fear. We all share this planet together. And I like to think that the Out of Eden Walk is a storytelling vehicle to reassure all of you guys that this whole planet is your home. It belongs to you. All right. Well, Paul, I can't thank you enough for spending another uh, chunk of time with us and catching us up on your journey so far. I do want to remind the classrooms, if you want to follow along more, check out some curriculum, learn more about the Out of Eden Walk. Uh, out of Eden Learn, so learn.outofedenwalk.com is the place you have to go and check out. And Paul, we wish you luck on the next leg of the journey, and we can't wait to have another global classroom uh, hangout with you. No, that's great, Joe. I, I, I thank you for having me back on, and I, I, I'm glad to have all you young walkers walk along with me through the storytelling. Great to have you. All right, let's turn the microphones on, boys and girls, nice and loud. Goodbye and thank you, and we'll sign off for today. Here we go. Oh. Okay, thanks so much, thanks so much, Paul. Until next time. All right.